Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. This week I have tidbits. I have a new book that I'm really excited about and want to tell you about. And I have updates on my knitting and spinning projects. So let's get started. For this first tidbit, I want to give you guys some information on the best ways of contacting me. I have various social media accounts. I have email. I have a post office box. I have a lot of different ways that people can contact me. And I want to let you know uh, which ways are most likely um, to get to me and so that I will see them sooner rather than later. If you want to contact me because you have a question about a project or a pattern that you're working on, the only way that I can help you with that is if you post a new thread in my Ravelry group and, and then post your question there. The reason for that is because my goal is to help as many knitters as possible. And therefore, I want the questions and the answers to be public so that other people can learn from the question and answers as well as to participate uh, by offering their solutions as well. So if you have a question like that, that is the only way that I am able to help you. If you have a question or need to contact me for some other reason, then uh, the two best ways of contacting me are either through a Ravelry direct message uh, or through the email address associated with my YouTube channel. So if you go to my YouTube homepage, uh, you will see that there is an about tab or menu option. And if you click on that, then you can see that I have a, a post office box and I also have an email address uh, where you can contact me that way. I'm getting quite a few people recently contacting me through uh, Instagram messaging. And if I, if you follow me and I'm following you back, then I will be notified that you've sent me a message. But if you, I am not following you and you send me a message, I don't get a direct notification. I sometimes don't notice those for several weeks. So, um, so the best way to contact me is either um, through a direct message in Ravelry or through the email address associated with my YouTube channel. This next tidbit came to me, I believe, through Instagram or Twitter, possibly both. I think it came from the Fleece to Fashion a social media feed. And it is a row counter. It's what's called a complex row counter. So this is from early in the 20th century, and it was a way of keeping track of, of things like shaping and pattern repeats and all that kind of thing. I just thought it was a, a really interesting uh, mechanical method of keeping track of, of where you are in a pattern. These days, many people use uh, apps on their phone or on a tablet. Um, I tend to use a combination of spreadsheets, uh, charts, and putting things physically on my knitting to help me keep track of, of where I am. But I'm always fascinated to see uh, what other knitters have come up with at different points and what helps different people at different times. This tidbit came to me in probably Twitter. I was probably retweeted by one of those fashion historians that I follow. So this is one of those academic conferences, except that anybody is welcome to attend. It's online Zoom type of event. Um, it's called Refashioning the Renaissance, and it's the fifth and final conference. There was a grant given to this group five years ago and they've had a conference every year and this will be the fifth and final one. The subtitle is Popular Groups and the Material and Cultural Significance of Clothing in Europe 1550 to 1650. 
And then there's a little bit more information. Refashioning the Renaissance Project combines theoretical perspectives and practical hands-on work to investigate how fashion emerged and developed amongst new social groups in 16th and 17th century Western and Nordic Europe. So I am going to leave information down below if it's something that you want to sign up for. I believe it doesn't, oh, I, I will put the, the dates on the screen. I don't have it in my notes here. I believe I believe it's either later this summer or early in fall. It might not be till September, but I'll leave that information down in the description as well as on the screen. This next tidbit came to me through Instagram, I believe, and it is about the second book in, I assume, a two volume series called The Victorian Dressmaker, Volume Two. And the first volume was, uh, I think, just sewing patterns. And this volume includes um, things like athletic wear. It's outdoor and sports attire. And the reason it drew my attention is because the picture that the author posted was of a, a woman from the 1890s who is a boxer who is wearing a sweater. And the author recreated that knitting pattern and then recreated the pose as well. So I'll leave a link uh, down to that Instagram photo. Um, but the, the book is entitled, again, Victorian Dressmaker Volume 2. There are so many words in our everyday language that come from textiles, and in particular come from the earliest textiles. And that's because textiles are really as old as human civilization. So the words that I want to talk about today are the words tent, tenter, and tenter hooks. There's an English phrase to be on tenter hooks, which means that you have anxiety or an anticipation about something that's, that's going to be happening soon. And where that phrase comes from is first, tent, I think we all know what a tent is, but originally a tent was a form of shelter that was stretched animal skins that would form um, some protection from the elements. A tenter was a rack that was used to stretch fabric. So this is something that is used or was used uh, when creating things like wool fabric. Um, they, would, they would stretch the fabric. So the, the frame that would stretch the fabric was called a tenter. And the tenter hooks were the hooks that would actually hold the fabric and keep it stretched out um, while it was drying or while it was being finished, fold or, or something like that. So I just thought that was really interesting and I'm wondering um, what sorts of words that are related to textiles you might find to be especially interesting. Let me know down in the comments. So now I want to talk about my various works in progress. I did a, a fix of a problem that I had in my vintage 60s sweater, which I'll show you briefly. Uh, I finished the first sock of the pair that I started. I think what I'm going to show you is before I did the toe. And then I want to show you the yarn that I spun last week. I finished the yarn and I knit it up into a swatch. I want to show you what that looks like. So um, that's what you'll be seeing in the next several overhead segments. When I knit this button band, once I got it done and I was looking at where the buttons were supposed to be placed, I realized that I'd actually worked the button band maybe three rows shorter than it should have been before um, I started the shaping for the yoke up here. It just wasn't quite long enough. So what I did was I, I snipped a row out and captured the live stitches on each of these needles. So these are the base, the, these are the running threads basically between stitches. Um, and then these are the heads of the stitches. So I worked another three rows and I've got the working yarn at this end. And what I am going to do is then graft these two back together in pattern. My intention was to film myself grafting this because it is a small graft. Uh, and I always have to look up the instructions for how to do this in pattern when it's uh, two things that were knit in the same direction. It's a bit different than if they were knit in opposite directions. So I was rolling the camera 
and talking through it, and I noticed that I was not on pattern. And so I took it all out, stopped, the, stopped filming, took it all out, started it up again, was off again, took it all out, and realized I had 11 loops on the top and 12 on the bottom. And so I had to figure out what I had missed um, on the bottom and recapture that. So I had 12 and 12. And I didn't turn the camera on again. I was just so focused on making sure that I could do this correctly. And I got about halfway through and I was completely on target. And I thought, well, uh, perfect. And then my brain started wandering and pretty soon I was off track again. So I had to find my way back to where I was still on track and finish up. And I, I finished up okay. There was a little bit of a glitch right in the middle. Um, and so then I had to use some duplicate stitch. But the graft is right in here and I think it's pretty, pretty well hidden. I don't think it, that it's going to be noticeable at all. There's a little bit of difference in some of the the stitch tensions here, but I'm not going to worry about it too much. I'm happy with it. I'm not going to need to rip this out and re-knit it, but uh, apologies for not being able to show this to you on camera. <laughs> I thought I'd talk a little bit about the construction choices I used for my sock. I call this a plain vanilla sock, meaning that it's just stockinette. My socks are always custom fit to the foot. So I don't just use the standard formula. I start with a standard sock formula and then I modify uh, typically at the heel and the toes. And sometimes I have to make an adjustment if the foot is different in circumference than the leg. Mine happen to be the same, but a lot of people I knit for either have a larger foot than leg or a larger leg than foot. Uh, I happen to have a very high arch, so I have trouble with short row heels and peasant heels, but I have figured out how to make calculations so that I can make modifications. And the particular heel that I'm using here is called a plain heel. It's just like a peasant heel, only you work it right when you get to it instead of coming back later and working the heel. So the way it's worked is you work the leg and then when it's time to work the heel, you, you have half of the stitches for the heel, like for any sock, and the, the other half right here are just going to rest while you work the heel. So these, these are live stitches right here, and then you do a provisional cast on right here so that you can work in the round down in that direction. And what you do with this provisional cast on is if you need to, the heel to be larger to have more stitches so that it will work for more rows, you can cast on more stitches than you have for this half. So if I had 32 stitches here, I don't have to do a provisional cast on that has 32 stitches. For me, I do a provisional cast on that has 40 stitches because I need that extra room. And as I work in the round, um, the half of the round that has extra stitches, the 40 stitches instead of the 32, I work a decrease on each side every other round until, I, until the two halves match, until I have 32 stitches on each half. And then I can switch to doing a decrease on each side of this line. Now, I, um, the, I'm doing single decreases, but I'm doing them so that they're pointed at each other like this and right next to each other instead of being pointed away with two stitches in between. I don't like that look. I like this look, or sometimes I will do a central double decrease so that there'd be like a line of stitches going all the way down. I've just done that a lot the past few num year. I've been doing that mostly. And so I just decided to do it this way instead. Once the heel is done and you rejoin the round in order to work the foot, you're gonna have those, uh, for me, I'm gonna have those 40 stitches on, still on this, hat, this side because I did a provisional cast on with 40 stitches. So once again, I'm going to decrease every other round on each side. Uh, on the sole half of the, of the round until I'm down to the stitch count that I actually need for the foot. So this is a place where if my foot was actually bigger around and I needed that room, I wouldn't have to do any decreases. Or if my foot was a lot skinnier, I could keep decreasing until I got the circumference that I wanted. 
So that's what I really like about the flexibility of this heel is that it allows you to make adjustments, not just for the heel, but also for the foot. And it lets you do it at the point when you would do other types of heels so that as you continue down the foot, you could try it on. You can really make adjustments about when you want to start the toes so that you can get a really excellent fit. Now, uh, I'm not crazy about the hole that I have here. I was trying a, a method of dealing with those corners that I heard about a couple of months ago that I, that's used for the underarms for top-down sweaters. And I thought it, would, it might potentially work really well for this type of heel. And I, I just didn't find that I, I liked it as much here. The other side, it, this is where I joined. So this side, I have a tail here besides, so I could close this up even more. On my second sock in this pair, I will use the technique that I normally use, and then I can compare and show you guys uh, the difference between those two different techniques. So the other thing I want to mention was you see all of these uh, stitch markers here. Because I know how many rounds and rows that I'm working and what my row gauge is and how long my foot is, I know how many rounds I want the foot to be. This green marker is showing you where that provisional cast on was. So I know that, that I, I have like 30 rows right here. And then for every 10 rounds I'm working in the foot, I'm keeping track because I know that once I have 88 rounds all together, that's going to be when I'm going to start my toe and I'm going to use a long version of the round toe because that's what's going to fit my foot. All of these different types of videos, the plain heel, this type of, of decrease, the, the round toe and how to adjust it for the length of your actual toes. All of those videos uh, are on my sock playlist, but I also have some playlists that are just devoted to peasant heels, plain heels. And then I have playlists for toes that show how uh, all the different things for how to modify those as well. So I'll leave that down in the show notes. So I wanted to show you what the yarn looked like after it was finished and then what it looked like in its watch. So I, my goal for this was just to get through the process and to kind of relearn how to spin and uh, just go through that whole process of what is finishing a yarn like and then and knitting with it. So I would say, you know, this is a woolen spun yarn and it's chain plied, which means any thicknesses and thin thinnesses in the, the single are going to be amplified when you ply them because you're, you're plying the same section of yarn together to create a three ply. So if there was a slightly thicker area and it was all being plied together, that would make an even thicker yarn and any thin area is going to be even thinner. So you get a less even yarn, plus I'm not that great a spinner yet. In many ways, I'm happier with this yarn than any yarn that I've actually um, completed because it has some life in it. It, it has some springiness to it and loft to it. Uh, the issue that I've had uh, previously has been that the yarns I end up with are like, just like rope hard. Um, I just sort of kill, killed the, um, the fiber. And so I was very happy to, to end up with a yarn that has some spring to it. I have no idea what the wool is, no idea. Uh, I did knit it up into a swatch. I, I thought it's probably about bulky weight. So I used a US 10 and a half, which is a six and a half millimeter needle. And I assumed I'd get about three and a half stitches per inch on that. And so I cast on 15 stitches and then I worked for, I don't know how many rows, but I worked it until I had about four inches. So I did end up with a four inch square. It only weighs a quarter of an ounce. So I have three quarters of an ounce still remaining. Um, which I'm happy about. I did want to make sure that I saved some of this yarn so that I, that I could uh, keep track of what I had done to some extent. I need to just practice taking notes uh, and keeping track of how I did things and, and keeping that um, in some sort of a record with the actual swatch. I was pretty happy actually that, that it knit up pretty nicely. It knit up much more evenly than I expected it to. There are some little thick areas, so it's a little bit thick and thin, but I was actually really happy with how, how it turned out. I have some little issues with my spinning. Like this is an area that was super, super thin. And so the, the plies 
uh, twisted on itself, um, uh, the or the single twisted on itself while I was trying to ply, and so I've got a few little tails like that. I, there's some name for that. I don't remember what it is. Overall, I was I'm actually much happier with this yarn than I expected it to be. And I just have to get used to what hand spun looks like because I haven't seen a lot of examples of it. A lot of the examples I see in magazine articles and on websites, um, people are creating yarn that I don't really like the look of. I want something more even. And that's because I'm used to commercially spun yarns, which are very even. And I, so I just have to get used to what a hand spun looks like and also just get better at spinning so that I can be more consistent, uh, which is what I would prefer um, to, to find in my yarn. So there are places in the yarn that I'm like, oh, I really like this section right here. <laughs> um, so there are sections that I like um, just fine, um, but it was a really good experience and I, I'm very happy that I, I did this in a fairly uh, short uh, period of time so that I could remember what I did and I just wish I knew a, what um, what this wool was. I've mentioned in the past couple of weeks that I've been delighted uh, to get back together with my knitting friends in a social knitting environment. One of the things that I really missed about going to a weekly knitting group was when people would just pass around books that they had gotten or patterns they had gotten or finished objects and just pass them around the room and then you'd all of a sudden something would appear in front of you and you're like, oh, what is this? And, and it would be just so interesting and amazing and it would be something that maybe you never in a million years would have encountered on your own. So there's a woman in my uh, Wednesday knitting group named Jean who always comes up with the most interesting things to knit. She'll do things like, uh, she'll just keep a list of favorites on Ravelry, like things that look like they would be interesting to knit. She just collects them. And then at some point, she'll just go through and she'll knit all of them. She doesn't necessarily want to keep them. She just wants the experience of knitting them. And then she'll send out an email to her family and say, claim what you want and I'll send it off to you. So she's a retired engineer. So we are very much both analytical and love mathematical types of uh, approaches to knitting. So she showed me this book last week and I couldn't believe it. I had to go home and order it right away. So the book is called Geometric Knit Blankets and it's by Margaret Holtzman. She is a retired engineer as well. Um, I think you could really call her a rocket scientist because <laughs> she used to work for the JPL laboratories. This is a book that has completely changed my mind about garter stitch and blankets and therefore garter stitch blankets. I usually find blankets incredibly boring. I need to anticipate that they're gonna take a year. Part of it is just it's a lot of knitting and I need to break that up with some timeouts. But some of it is just, they're boring. There's no shaping to them. It's the same thing. It's very repetitive and I just get to where I can't stand it anymore. What she has done is basically figured out a way to take the kinds of really interesting geometric and colorful patterns that you will see in quilting and transform them into knitting. I'm going to do an overhead of this and this is probably the longest knitting book review I've ever done and I think it's just mostly because I think she's a freaking genius <laughs> and I love the colors. I love everything about it. I'm going to leave a link below also to a series of YouTube videos. She did a presentation about this book like how how it was born, the idea for it was born, her process for figuring out how it was going to get published, how she figured out uh, how she was going to get all that knitting done by the deadline, um, and then what all of the different elements of the uh, the different various designs are. So um, I'm going to go to the overhead now and you can get a closer look at this book, but I, I honestly, this first time I've ever looked forward <laughs> To knitting a blanket and then the choice of like trying to figure out what it is I'm going to knit. Um, it's pretty exciting. I have another grand niece or nephew along, uh, who is going to be born around Thanksgiving so I'm thinking that I might have a baby blanket in my future. So let's take a look at what's inside of this particular uh, book. What is amazing about the blankets in here is that her inspiration 
comes from fabric quilts as well as tiles and things like that. But it takes the, uh, the ability of garter stitch to be worked in a lot of different geometric directions uh, to an, the next level. So Margaret Holzman is the designer. She is a retired engineer from uh, the JPL uh, laboratories. So she's literally a retired rocket scientist. Um, so here's a little glimpse at the different designs, um, types of motifs that are in this particular book. And then we've got uh, some more right here. So these blankets are put together in a variety of way and some blankets have multiple options. So some of them are knit in pieces that are seamed. Some have situations where you're picking up stitches. Sometimes you're starting in the center and knitting your way out. Sometimes you start from the outside and knit your way in. Sometimes there's a combination of techniques. But again, some blankets, there are multiple options so that you either don't have to seam or you don't have to have the entire thing on your lap. And so these patterns are really flexible in that particular way. So she includes a Venn diagram uh, in the front that explains for, uh, that has all the different names of the types of blankets and a Venn diagram to show what techniques are used in which blankets. Now, when you see wrap and turn short rows, so the technique that's used in here is wrap and turn, but there's no need to try to substitute it. In fact, I would recommend against trying to substitute for a different type of short row because this is garter stitch and the wrap will hide, that horizontal wrap will hide in the garter stitch. The wraps are not picked up later. Um, and that's really important um, when you are working in garter stitch that you don't have anything disrupting the pattern. Uh, on either side, although there will be a right side and a wrong side to these blankets. So all of them have pick up and knit in some way. Um, and then, uh, but some of them have intarsia um, or like this, this pattern right here has uh, intarsia or sew blocks and strips together. Um, there's some that start have a pinhole cast on, some are outside shapes in the round. Um, this one is intarsia. Uh, Rick rack could be uh, intarsia, but also um, three needle bind off is used in, in some places to join them. So there are a lot of different combinations. So you can either avoid or seek out techniques that you particularly like. Um, so she shows you an example, like it's hard to believe that this is, uh, this is knitted in garter stitch, um, but it is. So the, the patterns are just amazing. And, and then she'll have uh, charts to help you figure out uh, how you're going to work things. Um, one of her goals in here was uh, the, for the yarns was to choose yarns that were machine washable. So in some cases that's acrylic. In other cases, it's like super washable or it might be a blend of some sort, but they needed to be machine washable and they needed to be to come in just tons of colors so that you could mix them. So some of these blankets have just tons of colors and some of them um, have just a few colors. So they're a little bit more monochromatic. Like I, you know, I just love this kind of thing. So she really understands that the sort of the, the quilters technique of using light and dark blocks and uh, how to use color. The, she's got a QR code in this book uh, at the back that, that takes you to uh, a website where she shows you the inspiration for each one of these, as well as other color options, color combination options, if, you, if that's something that's uh, harder for you to do, like it would be uh, for me. So this is a very classic looking sort of fabric quilt uh, design, and yet it's all in garter stitch. So she also has some that are more monochromatic black and white grays types of, of patterns. Some of them use yarns that have, that are tonal rather than being solid. This one uses uh, speckled yarns. In some cases, when I look at some of these, they almost look like 
paintings or a print rather than like knitting. When you can't see the stitches, to me, this just looks like someone painted this. It's hard to believe that these stitches were actually knitted. Uh, but if you zoom in so that you can see, yes, these are knitted. This is an example of a type of blanket where they're using a three needle bind off in order to, to close these edges here in the, in the center. Another sort of classic uh, quilt design. This is the one from the cover. I quite like this one as well. I think this is interesting. So she has a, a website and she's got a YouTube channel where she's got a four part a series of talks that, that she gave to, I, I don't know if it was a guild or some sort of knitting group, uh, speaking about this book and, and how it came about and how she planned it uh, and how um, she got the, the patterns uh, test knit or sample knitted and um, produced and all the way through. So, and talking about color choices and things like that. I just think this is an amazing book. I typically don't like garter stitch and I don't like blankets, usually because it, I just find it uh, tedious. And, you know, blankets are big projects and they just get boring after a while. But this looks like, uh, interesting ways of using garter stitch and fantastic use of color and shaping uh, that would make it uh, really compelling to knit. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.